Yeah. Uh, hi, so I'm Darren. Um, I uh, have a little company called Minus 40 with uh, my partner Tony. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about value objects and a little bit about domain driven design, which kind of all relates to each other. So, um, what are value objects? Well, uh, Martin Fowler, who seems to be the Dr. Dre of the software <laughs> community, um, says it's a small, simple object like money or a data range using quality as a baseline identity. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, to understand value objects, we need to have uh, a little conversation about domain-driven design, which um, is essentially a series of ideas and patterns that help you model uh, complex applications. It places the emphasis on understanding the uh, domain and the business rules, uh, the business domain, that is, not the domain name. Um, and attempts to closely map the core domain into software to enforce the business rules. Um, and these concepts apply to most um, object oriented languages, not just PHP. One of the terms you'll hear around the major design, if you investigate it, is the uh, ubiquitous language. Um, so, developers and domain experts, usually the client, um, should create a common language for discussion of the project. So, for example, to create an account, the user should submit a full name, a valid email address, and a date of birth. But what does an account mean? Is it a user account? Is it a bank account? A current account? A savings account? Or an account of something that happened? So, you need to work with the client to develop a, um, a language or words that actually make sense when you're talking about the project. To make it less confusing for you, make it less confusing for the client, and you're not making mistakes when they ask you for something. So in this case, I just separated that out into um, user account, saving account, current account, and testimonial instead of an account or something like that. And when I'm working with a client, then I would use these terms consistently. I would have the rest of the team use these terms consistently, and that starts to um, show throughout your project. So value objects that are part of the DDD domain. Um, they help you enforce your business rules by encapsulating behavior and representing the ubiquitous language that you've developed in your code. They don't have an identity, so for example, they might be dates, money, coordinates, um, and they're immutable. You don't change a value object's value, you replace the value object completely, you create a new one, and we'll see that in a second. So let's do an example. So if a client says to us, when a customer registers an account, they need a full name, an email address, and a date of birth, and we're going to use a, a banking account as an example. Um, so, We'll expand that out a little bit. Well, what does a full name mean? Well, a full name is a forename and a surname. And for this example, we'll not use a middle name. Uh, an email address should be completely valid. A date of birth should be both a valid date and the customer needs to be over 18. These are the business rules when opening a new bank account. Well, how can we make sure that those things exist when a, com uh, a customer is registered in our system? Well, we can create a customer class. And to construct it, you need a name, an email address, and a date of birth. And I'm just creating a, a little static function that can actually do that. So when you're writing your code down here, that's actually really readable. You know exactly what you're doing instead of new customer or whatever it is. That I'm actually registering a customer in this case. So does this actually do what we wanted to do based on the rules that we had? Well, we know that we need three variables to create a customer. We don't really know what these three variables are, and. We're not enforcing any of the rules that a full name actually consists of a forename and a surname or a date of birth um, has to be a valid date and customers are over 18. We're not doing any of that at the minute. So that's where value objects come in. So let's create a value object for the um, full name. And they're basically just classes that encapsulate little bits of functionality in your application and enforce these rules completely. So you can't create a name or full name without having a forename or a surname. And then they're validated and normalized. So every name going into my database is lowercase, and then the first letter is uppercase. So it's just consistent. People fill it in all lowercase or capitalize every single word. It's just consistent every time it's going into my database. So as you can see there, um, just I will be creating a new full name object, passing in my full name and surname. They're validated and normalized using the, the private function. And I can cast that object to a string if I want to use it later on. And then I can change my customer class to require a full name object instead of just a variable. So now I'm actually meeting those business rules. A full name has to consist of a full name and a surname. And when I register a customer, they have to have a full name. 
email address works the same sort of way. It's just a little class. You pass in um, a value. It's validated. It's uh, lowercase just to keep it consistent when we persist it. And again, we can cast it to a string too. And similarly, then we actually just require that as part of our registration when we're creating a new customer. Does this all make sense so far? Am I going too quick? I'm trying to rush through this. Uh, date of birth, slightly more complicated, but pretty much works on the same basis. You create a date of birth object, you make sure it's a valid date, uh, and then we make sure that, uh, that the person's not too young. I haven't tested any of this code, I just wrote it uh, verbatim this afternoon without like, looking at it. So uh, I just wrote some like custom exceptions and things as well, but I find those useful if you want to actually, for example, we've got two different instances here where something could go wrong, and we can catch those and do something completely different than each other. And finally then we pass that in. So in this case then, are we meeting the business rules that we're given? Well, a customer cannot be registered without a full name, which consists of a foreign and a surname, without a valid email address, or uh, without a date of birth, and the date of birth is going to be over 18. So that all make sense? Yeah. So how do we use this? And well, we'll give some examples then of how this all kind of sits. Well, if I'm registering a customer, I create a new full name object. I pass in, I meant to pass in a surname there as well, but uh, so that would throw an error. Um, create a new email address, and I create a new date of birth based on whatever input source that I have. And then I can update the email address. When I'm updating the email address, I don't update the email address value. I create a new email address to make sure that the data is always valid in my business domain. It's always a valid email address that I'm passing around. It's never just a string. Um, you can also do something like relocate to and pass in an address object, which would have your address line one, address line two, postcode, etc. And that is going to be in a valid address throughout your application. So you can always use that value object wherever you want a valid, valid address, and you know it's going to be a valid address. It's always going to happen. Um, in the case of banking, you might want to deposit some money, so you create a money object to make sure that it's a numeric value and has a certain range, for example, or, or whatever your business rules are. Similarly, you can do draw. When you get these objects, like get balance, that would return a money object. Um, or get age um, might return an age object, which you can then do something with. Um, so that all sounds kind of good and interesting, but what's the point? Well. First of all, by using real English for method names and class names, uh, instead of just having strings passed in, you're actually improving communication because everybody starts to understand what's going on in your application. Um, your data that you're passing around is always in a validated state. There's no way that you can pass an email address into the core of your application that isn't completely valid. Even if somebody gets past the uh, front-end validators on your website, your form validators, once that email address that passes through gets to your classes and exception stones, they're never ever going to be persisted. Um, improves the legibility of your code, it's just really, really nice to read when you're writing in plain English. By encapsulating um, value objects and full name or email address, you can actually make them testable classes. So I can test that email address is completely valid by throwing stuff at it and uh, writing tests for it, making sure it all works properly. You can include some specialized methods on the classes themselves. So on date of birth, for example, I can return it as years, I could return it as how many days they've been alive, I can check if it's their birthday. Those can all be put onto your value objects, and then you can pull them out of your system. Um, and then just a few quick notes. It doesn't replace your input validation on, on the front end. Um, they're deeper than that. Value objects are, once people get past the front end, to make sure that the core of your application isn't accepting values that aren't valid. For example, you might have a form on your website that um, validates the address, but somebody's forgot to put the validation on the mobile app that's using the same API. So your business rules are enforced here. The presentation layer doesn't matter to a certain extent if, if somebody's missed something. Um, you'll need to use a data mapper like Doctrine 2 to make your life easy. So when you um, <coughs> pass your value object to your property of your class, and save that, persist that, and that maps those values to the database on your, on your database data. Uh, it's not always right or necessary to use value objects, so you just need to um, have a look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. 
say if it's right for you and for your project, generally it's for larger projects that you absolutely need to enforce lots of quite complex business rules. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it. I rushed through it, but you have any questions? Again, make clearer. Very, very reusable. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's really, sure. really nice. It's almost like a sort of meta language in itself. You can use the same classes throughout all of your projects and they all have the same look and feel and same sort of structure, internal structure. Well, I know, like PHP kind of lacks type hinting at the moment yeah. to a certain extent. And it's a way to kind of get around that, but it also adds functionality to your values as well. Yeah. Since, you know, if you, if you need to format a data as something you're not having to, you know, Write out the same method every time you include a method in the in the value yeah, object. I'll just spit it out in whatever format that you want. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a nice way of, of doing it. Mm. Is anybody using this at all? No? I'd, I'd really recommend looking into it. And then command driven development is, is a much bigger talk with lots and lots of facets. But um, it's it's a really nice way to work, and it's like it makes your code so readable and, and understandable, and actually. It looks like you're creating lots more classes, and you kind of are. There's only a few lines in each one, and down the line, you're going to love your stuff again. So, do, do you ever um, run into, like, especially on large projects, do you ever run into situations where you have so many classes floating around, mm -hmm. and you can never remember which ones are persisted and which ones are value? Yeah. Um, value classes? So, uh, that's a good question. Generally, um, the way I work, I, I use Doctrine pretty much consistently now. And uh, the way you would work there is, if I, I'll just go back a few slides if you don't mind. Um, so I have a customer here. Um, so for example, if I'm passing in a new address here, all that method is really doing is setting the address property to equal the class it's passed in. That's all it's doing. And then when I persist it, Doctrine is taking that class, breaking down the properties within it, and persisting those as part of my customer uh, table, essentially. Uh, so that's kind of how that works. Um, so in, in Doctrine, you can use um, XML, I think, to set up um, what your feed values and stuff are, or you can use uh, annotations. Um, so I just use annotations because it's nice and clean. But um, <coughs> yeah, it, you just basically say, uh, customer address maps to this value object, and in the value object you say address line one is a string or address line two is whatever, um, and then it just it, it maps it for you and persists. You can do it by doctrine, but it's a bit more complicated. And, uh, I, just, I just imagine that like I mean, address is, a, is a, an example of something that could easily be persisted as like in, a, in an online store, for example, a right. customer might have multiple addresses persisted yeah. as, a, as a database object, mm -hmm. and then you're also passing around. You know these address value stores, and you yeah. get really. It's, I imagine yeah. it'd be very easy to get confused if you have lots of these objects floating around. Yeah, that's that's a fair that's a fair point. Because um, it's hard you, to then pick a, a, a name in the common language that then works for both types of things. Yes, yeah. uh, that would really come down to uh, if you go into to driven development a little bit more. So they they talk about bounded contexts, um, and a bounded context is really like separating up your business concerns. So for example, um, human resources wouldn't necessarily interact with, the sales team wouldn't necessarily interact with uh, customer services teams. So those are your bounded contexts. But customer in each one of those contexts is pretty much the same thing. Um, but a customer in each one of those contexts may not have the same properties. So if you're creating something that big, you would actually have different customer entities. And within those contexts, you would also have different address value objects or in, in the case of um, your example where you have multiple addresses, well, in that case, an address would actually have an identity and it would become an entity rather than a value object. Mm -hmm. Is that confusing? Sorry if that's a bit... No, it's, it's complex. Just, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. No, that's a good that, that, that address. Yeah. Yeah. Darren, hi. hi. Uh, what was your company again? Sorry. Minus 40. Minus 40. And you build applications more than other stuff? Is uh, it well, we, we, we vary. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't lie and say that a lot of our work isn't standard websites, um, but you know, we've built applications and other bits and bobs. Anybody else? No? Okay, um, you mentioned you wouldn't use it for, uh, uh, for form validation. Yeah, so value objects aren't there to 
and um, validate your forms. They're there to validate the data once it's got past that stage. So as, as I say, you might have um, one API or one application that controls a presentation layer on the web, or a mobile one, or you might have a command line interface to control something, or you might have a desktop application, or your client team might have some software that does something, you know, there, there's all these different things that they might all be interested in setting the same data source. Right. So what this is doing is, no matter where individual bits of data are coming from, this is saying, unless you meet this specific criteria, you're not getting in. And that might say, mean that you're, um, there's a problem with your website because it's letting through invalid email addresses, or there's a problem with your mobile app because it's letting through somebody with the same submitting their first name. But once it gets to this stage, it's going to go, no, you're not getting in because these are the business rules. You must have these things. Right. Now, wouldn't that mean a lot of a duplicate code? Say you've already implemented uh, email validation. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, you're you duplicating your validation in the sense that you're checking here if an email address is valid. But let's take a, an Angular application, for example. So you would use Angular to validate your form, and then it's going to post to your API. Um, and then you might validate it in PHP there, and then send back a response to that. Let's say you're not validating in PHP just for a crude example. So actually, I could send a curl request to your endpoint, the Angular sending that to you, and just send through any data I want, and the Angular validation is completely invalid. So what this is doing is enforcing the rules deeper down to say, actually, no matter what you try and get into this system, unless it meets the core set of rules that I've designed, even if the front end guy has mucked something up, if, I, if you don't meet the core set of rules that I've designed from, from day one, then you don't get it. I mean, you could still expose an endpoint that still uses the same class to check it, and just if it throws an yeah, exception, yeah, 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 you absolutely. Could use yeah, it. yeah, yeah, you could just yeah. So you're still it. using the same logic. You could do that, yeah, absolutely. Um, I tend not to, but that's just personal preference. So, so, so it's valid. Um, so yeah, it's really about enforcing that um, it doesn't matter what sort of gets in that first layer of your application. If it doesn't meet what the client requested at that stage, then it's just it's not getting. Um, but also, it's not just about validation, it's about exposing these other methods that allow you to deal with that data in, in a nice, manageable way.